Father in heaven, we do thank you, Lord. We thank you for the blessing of the day and even, even just a little bit of the coolness outside, Father. Lord, we thank you for the church. We thank you for the universal church, Lord, all believers everywhere, even throughout time, throughout all parts of the globe. We thank you for the local church, and we thank you for this local church of Calvary Bible Church, like Jim said, that has lasted for so long. And in some ways, that's, that's a rare thing, to find a church that started and was founded on the Word of God, and through its, what, 70-plus year history, continues just firmly rooted in the Word of God. We thank you. We thank you for all of the, the folks that call Calvary Bible their church home. We thank you, Lord, for, as was said earlier, the privilege, the privilege of being able to come together corporately to worship you, to exalt your Son, to make much of the name of Jesus. And Lord, we have enjoyed fellowshipping with one another and lifting up our voices in song to you and praying and Lord, participating in, in the, the supper. And now, Lord, we will dive into your word. And Lord, may it have its good and desired effect in our lives. May we, Lord, see, hear, experience the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. And if there are any here that might need to repent and believe that they would do so before they walk out of here this morning. And for the rest of us that count it a privilege to know you and your son, that it will cause us to grow in godliness, grow in Christ-likeness, that we would be matured and, and that we would be renewed and always ever-changing to become more like Jesus. <clears throat> we pray for this time that it would be a blessing to you and that it would bless us as well. We pray this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word. You can turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where we will read again this passage, verses 13 to 15, where Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, and he say, says this in verse 13, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. This is the word of God, friends. You may be seated. <clears throat> when we got to this passage, you have to excuse me this morning. I had a cold earlier in the week and over the cold part, but it's just that lagging <clears throat> congestion and uh, coughing and I apologize. But when we got to this passage, we kicked off a, a mini-series, a mini-study here on salvation and the sovereignty of God. This is now part six. I think we'll have one more, maybe two, not, not sure just yet, and then we'll continue to move on in our um, book of Thessalonians. But just as the quickest of recaps, when you go back to week, week one, we had to talk about the depravity, the utter sinfulness of man and man's inability to do anything to save himself. Week two was then about the doctrines of election and predestination and foreknowledge and how God chooses some for salvation. Week three, we asked the question, why does God choose some and not others? And that took us to that classic passage of Romans 9, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. And we, we learn there, too, that we have to be very careful about crying out, you know, those couple of words, uh, three words, that's not fair, or that doesn't seem fair, 
Because, friends, we learned from that passage, there is absolutely no injustice with God. We don't want what's fair, frankly. Week four took us to asking a couple of more questions, or lesson four. If God desires all people to be saved, how come all people aren't saved? As well as, how does my free will fit in with God's sovereignty? And then last week was all about the gospel, the good news of Christ. It's appropriation, that is the, what God does to prepare a person to even hear or receive the gospel. Then the application of, well, that moment in time or moments... What that period of time where you are hearing, receiving, understanding the gospel, and then the results of the gospel, what would take place from that moment on, on into eternity. This brings us to this week, week number six, in our next installment in this series, Your Eternal Security. Your Eternal Security. This doctrine is also known as the preservation of the saints, or maybe even more accurately, the preservation or, or preservation of the saints, some call it also the perseverance of the saints, that the saints would be preserved or the saints would persevere. Or again, maybe more accurately, the perseverance of God in the saints, that God would persevere in the life of a believer to bring that person to that, that full and final aspect of salvation, which would be, of course, our glorification to live with Christ forever in his heavenly kingdom. Now, as we go through these different doctrines, we might view them like a tapestry. If you pictured a big, giant tapestry, and when viewed from the front, it just might be a, a, a thing of beauty. You see different colors and and different configurations or, or a, a scene on that tapestry. And it looks perfect, beautiful, wonderful. But maybe if you were to go back behind that tapestry, you might see something different. You might see these different threads and things uh, knotted and tied together. And, and kind of here, there, and everywhere. And you go, wait a minute, that, that's the same tapestry? That, that, that doesn't look like anything. In fact, it, it looks like a mess, but on the front side, it is absolutely beautiful. Now, what would happen, too, if on that back side you took a pair of scissors and started cutting those, those threads? Well, then the tapestry, because it is all interwoven, each thread dependent on the other will start to unravel. And not just that particular color But the unraveling will affect all of the other parts and pieces. And the whole thing starts to fall apart. And this is also the way it is with these these doctrines. These beautiful, wonderful doctrines of grace that we have been examining. Because if one is cut or one is removed, then what happens is, is the rest start to unravel. And disaster ensues. I remember learning from my mom. I, I've shared this before. My mom was great and that she taught me just a few basic things that I would need to know in life. One was she taught me how to sew on a button. She taught me how to cook a basic meal. Uh, I remember in the sewing department, she taught me about how if you, if you had a snag, you know, a thread... Um, And this happens to me, and I still do this, like on my pants or what have you. Don't cut the thread, right? But take a needle, and she showed me how to push the thread back inside so it goes to the other side. And on the front, looks fine, looks normal, looks great. Yeah, if you were to look inside, you'd see some of these threads kind of hanging around there. and, and But if I'd cut it, it would have created a hole, and the hole would have eventually gotten bigger. So we have to be careful with these doctrines in this way. And such it is with eternal security. If eternal security is cut, if eternal security is removed, then all the rest that we have been studying start to unravel and fall apart. 
I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let, let's 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 kind of start here by asking some questions. And and you don't have to answer out loud. You can just be thinking of the answers, and you might think that these are somewhat simple questions. And and but let's let's kick it off here with this: Does a Christian have eternal security? Does a Christian have eternal security? Can you trust? That once you have been saved, you will remain saved until you are with Christ for all eternity. Or to put it another way, can you in any way lose, forfeit, or hand back your salvation? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the, uh, the answer, which will be obvious and probably of no surprise to many of you, if not most, because it's what you've always known to be true. It's what Calvary Bible Church has always known to be true and, and believed and preached and, and taught because it, of course, is what the Scriptures teach that, praise the Lord, no, you cannot lose your salvation. Amen? Amen. Once God has graciously and sovereignly saved you, you will be graciously and sovereignly kept until that day when you are forever with your Savior. Your salvation, friends, is 100% absolutely eternally secure. I don't want you to take my word for it, though. I don't even want you to take our, our church's word for it but rather we want to let Scripture be our authority. In doing so, we're going to learn about this doctrine in three respects. First, we're going to consider some of the, the major passages that some like to go to to try and say that you can lose your salvation. Then we'll survey those that explicitly teach that you cannot under any circumstances, lose your salvation. And then lastly, we'll just consider for a few moments a potential doctrinal disaster that if we start cutting at these threads, what might happen? So first, first question, we'll do it in the form of questions. Can you lose your salvation? Now, can you imagine if every time you sinned, you lost your salvation? Right? I mean, well, okay, well, what if it wasn't every time, but, but, but only after committing certain, you know, really bad sins? But which sins would those be? What if, you, what if you didn't exactly know which sins would cause you to lose your salvation? What if you had to go through each day or each month or each year wondering if you were saved or not? Wait a minute. Am I, did, I, did I lose it, or am I, am I in Christ? Do I have it? Did I, did I sin recently and so bad that I've lost it, and, and, and do I need to get it back? And, and I mean, do you think that might cause just a, a wee bit of anxiety? Do you really think you're going to have the peace that passes all understanding if that were the case? Do you think that you could have a life filled with joy in the Lord? If you were always wondering, asking that question? Now, for a moment, just <clears throat> think back to your life as an unbeliever. Your life as an unbeliever and coming to the realization that if you were to die, you didn't know if you were going to heaven or hell. What about when you knew you were going to hell and not heaven? I mean, wasn't that a scary, scary thought? Didn't that terrify you? Didn't that keep you awake at night? I know it did me. I can remember those days. I remember those times. I remember first just being fearful of just flat out dying and death. But then when I came to that understanding that I, I'm probably going to hell, that was even scarier. I mean, can you imagine having those fears kind of consistently as a Christian, as a believer in Christ, always wondering if you were on the road to heaven or am I on the road to hell? 
Then you think, well, what's the point then? Right? I mean, what would the point of being a Christian be? I, having to live like that, it, I think, you know, could turn you into a schizophrenic, right? At the very least, at the very least, I think we would become obsessed maybe with trying to keep ourselves saved. Yeah, did you get that? <laughs> you, you, would, you would quickly get to the point where you are not trusting in God's grace and sovereignty for your salvation, but rather than you start to trust in yourself because you figure you have to try and keep yourself saved. I have to, I have to do this. I have to keep myself on the right path, make sure I'm going to heaven, not hell. And you think, that, that's just so wrong. According to the scriptures, that's wrong. And yet there are these passages that we come across in the Bible that some people believe, teach, that you can lose your salvation. The big problem here, nine times out of ten, what's usually the culprit? Context. People will take things out of context, or they don't take the time to understand what the proper context is. Now, for the sake of time, we won't be able to consider every passage uh, that people use to try and show that you can lose your eternal security. So, We'll just look at a few of the biggies and know that the, the other ones kind of fall into the, the same basic camp. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. Crossroads, this will be familiar to you because we talked about this uh, last week in our class. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. <clears throat> now, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to give you the context like I normally would. That's for a reason, okay? I want you to just see how this reads without the context on its own and why some people believe that this teaches that a Christian can lose their salvation. The author of Hebrews says this beginning in verse 4. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Just pause here for a moment. What does that sound like? It sounds like a believer, doesn't it? It, it sounds like a Christian. We'll continue. And then have fallen away. And let me just insert here. Parapipto. Parapipto. It means to abandon by willful sin, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Huh. Now let's talk about the context. The context of Hebrews and who it was written to and, and, and what period of time is very important towards properly interpreting this passage. While the letter was certainly written to a community of Jews who had converted to Christianity, there were undoubtedly unbelievers who maybe believed the gospel intellectually, up here in their mind, their brain, but not in their hearts. Not in their hearts. And we see that in the church all the time. We see tares amongst the wheat unbelievers amongst the believers. Now, sometimes what happens is that people show up and they just kind of, they just want enough. They just want enough of Christianity. They, they want to be called a Christian. They want to feel like a Christian, but they want to do so on their terms only. It's about them getting what they want out of church. They're basically looking to satisfy their own selfish needs. And maybe that means that they are willing to go to church and serve in some capacity, even give to the church. So they falsely repent and make a shallow profession of faith, but this was not the real deal. It was more like the seed that fell on the rocky soil or even amongst the thorns and the thistles. And, and what happens is, is they're basically ready to jump ship as soon as things get rough or they're not getting what they want out of it it might be the equivalent of dating without marrying there's a level of commitment that's missing this person in this situation is not 
all in. Now there's another group here that we might consider or we might call fence sitters. Those who are attracted to the gospel, they're attracted to the person of Christ somehow, some way. They're, they're checking things out, but they have not yet placed their faith in him for their salvation. This means they have not yet been drawn by God to him. He has not removed those blinders. They have not truly come to him. They are still seekers and maybe investigators who haven't come yet to a true saving faith conviction. (coughs) That the persecution of Christians was preeminent at the time. Back then, when this letter was written, and to come down on the side of true belief in Christ almost meant for certain that you would endure hostilities of one kind or another. In the course of this letter, the author wants to specifically address these groups of not genuinely saved people and give them some dire warnings about being this quote-unquote fair-weather Christian. Fence sitters, not committing to Christ, not truly committing to his gospel. And he does so on several occasions. This passage here in Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 being one of the prime ones. So now, with this context in mind, let's ask this. Is it possible that there could be people in the church who are not true believers, but who, because of their participation in the church, they have been enlightened and even tasted the heavenly gift? Could there be those in the church that are unsaved and yet have partaken of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come to some degree? Now think about the church back then. Do you think that there were those who heard firsthand accounts of the miracles that had been performed through Christ and his apostles? Do you think that there were people in the church that witnessed even the inspired preaching and teaching of the apostles? People that saw what God was doing even in the midst of their persecution and, and, and people who were still just kind of hanging around and yet not truly committing to the gospel. And, and we would say, yes, of course there were. These were those who were enlightened by the gospel. In some sense, they tasted it and its heavenly gift. They tasted the gospel truth from Holy Spirit-inspired preaching and by being other around other Holy Spirit-filled believers in the church. But unfortunately, they never, they never swallowed the gospel. They popped it in their mouth. They kind of chewed on it, maybe swirled it around a bit, and then pff, spit it out. Spit it out. Notice, too, it doesn't say that they received the Holy Spirit or that they were indwelt or filled or that the Holy Spirit abided in them or that they were even sealed by the Holy Spirit. It just says they were partakers of the Holy Spirit. So if someone is a part of the church for any length of time and they're amongst, again, Holy Spirit-filled believers, people who have the Holy Spirit abiding in them, with them, then they're around these works of the Holy Spirit. Will they not be partakers or affected by the work of the Holy Spirit to some degree? And yes, again, of course they will. They will benefit from the fellowship of this Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit indwelt congregation. Now back then, this also could have included the miraculous workings of the Holy Spirit in the sense of, Just like it rains on the just and the unjust, there is some effect that those who are unbelievers will sense or have because of, again, the way the Holy Spirit would be working in that body of believers. Now, along with this, these people have also, it says, tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. 
through the preaching, through the teaching, and the redeemed congregation members living out their faith alongside them, loving God and loving one another and practicing the fruits of the Spirit. These people are witness to this. They would have been witness to the great hope of the age to come by those in the church and especially the hope that they had even while they were enduring persecution. And, and they would have been, been witness to God still growing his church even during a difficult time. To this end, probably one of the greatest examples that we could have of a person like this would be Judas Iscariot. I mean, think about it. If there was ever somebody in Scripture who was enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift of the gospel, was made a partaker of the Holy Spirit, who tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then still fell away, it was him, the son of perdition. Let's think about it in a more modern context. Even a church like Calvary Bible Church. Imagine somebody showing up to Calvary Bible Church as an unbeliever. Maybe even a skeptic. But, you know, they've made a decision for whatever reason to come. And even to get involved. And they show up to church regularly. And they start making friends. And they find areas or ways to serve. They're even giving to the church. And, and maybe they get their kids involved as well. And vacation Bible school or adventure club or youth group and and they make efforts to even help out in those ministry and and they start attending fellowship events uh, even men's or women's conferences and and maybe once in a while they show up to a a Bible study or 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 a small group would you say that that they would be enlightened that they have tasted of the heavenly gift, made partakers of the Holy Spirit, tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come? Of course they did. Of course they did. Guess what? This was Julie and I before we got saved showing up here to Calvary Bible for a year, maybe two years, not quite sure. But back to this person that then falls away, Something happens in their life. Something happens in their life. Maybe it was catastrophic. Maybe it wasn't so catastrophic. But they decide at some point to let all of this go by the wayside. In fact, they actually repudiate Christ. They deny him and the power of his spirit. They completely reject Jesus. And the sad truth is, what comes in Hebrews 6 and verse 6 because if they then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. Now the reason why is that someone in this kind of a situation, for them to have been so, so intimately acquainted with and even involved in the church and, and to have heard the word and experienced the Holy Spirit the way they did, frankly, they will, they will not receive as much revelation as they would have in that kind of a situation probably ever again. They will never have as clear a testimony as to the power of God working through a local church and the gospel of God as what they had received at that time. And so for them to reject it all it means that's it. It's over for them. It's done. Their rejection at that point in the game is, is the same as crucifying Jesus and putting him to open shame all over again. That's the equivalent. Done, finished, cannot be again renewed to repentance. So, in summary, what the author of Hebrews was dealing with was not true believers, but rather fence sitters, people who had been given a tremendous amount of revelation and, and experiences. 
godly experiences, holy uh, spirit affecting experiences, only to then turn around and reject it all. There's another warning passage with the same theme. It's in Hebrews 10, 26 to 29. We we're going to talk about it a little more in depthly, but, but we're going to just, just give you some of the, the big, big points there. But in Hebrews 10, 26 to 29, we're just going to look at 26 and 27. It says, for if we go on sinning willfully, that's uh, intentional, habitual sin, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, saying something very similar, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. Now, because the author's use of we, for if we go on sinning people who believe that you can lose your salvation or that's what this is teaching, they say, well, see, this is is talking about saved Christians because the author is obviously a a Christian who's including himself with these that he's writing to when he says we. Or, or could it be a style of writing where the author includes himself not in the sense of explicitly saying that he is one of these unbelievers, but rather including himself in a more general sense. In other words, if this were true of any of us who went on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, Here's the consequences. And if this were the case, friends, then they would actually be showing themselves to be not believers, but actually unbelievers. Maybe professing believers, again, who are not truly saved. Again, I offer Judas as kind of the the poster boy for this kind of a poser. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 2. This is that great resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians 1, 15, 1 to 2. It's Paul writing to the church at Corinth. And he says this, verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, by which also you are saved. Here's kind of the, the, the kicker word. If, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And, and people go to that, that word, then they go, boy, that, man, that sure sounds like, like your salvation is dependent on you holding fast the word and not believing vainly, meaning you could lose it. The fact is, some were believing in vain because they were not convinced of the resurrection. And if you're not convinced of the resurrection, there's no way you could possibly be saved. Just zero possibility if you're not convinced of that. Because salvation hinges on this truth. In other words, those who do believe and are saved, they will Hold fast the word that Paul preached to them. If they don't, they believe vainly, which is not true belief at all, but rather it is a shallow, superficial, non-saving kind of faith. So again, this is not referring to losing your salvation, but rather those that are truly saved will have their holding fast the word as the proof of their salvation. We're going to talk more about that either next week or the week after. Your assurances of salvation. Turn to Galatians 5.4. Galatians 5.4. Just a little bit to the right there. Now, Galatians 5.4, if we jumped even right towards the end of this passage, and we just looked at the very last phrase, we would read this. You, he's writing to the, the um, Galatian people there, uh, the believers, and he says, if we just caught that last phrase, you have fallen from grace. You've fallen from grace, and, and you might be like, whoa, 
Yeah, I mean, that sounds pretty clear, right? That someone can fall away from their salvation, their salvation being represented by the grace of God, but not so fast. Because Paul clarifies who he is talking about in verse 3, and then the beginning of verse 4. So if we back up to verse 3, he says, And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision, that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. So Paul, in dealing or writing to the church at Galatia, is dealing with some of these, these Jewish folks that thought they could be Christians as well as good Mosaic law keepers alike. And Paul says, no, no, no. No, that doesn't work. No way. If you choose to go the law route and you trust in circumcision to justify you, which is to say to save you, then you are under obligation to keep the whole law. There isn't any stumbling in, in any points, right? Which we know is impossible to do. It's why Christ came to die for us. And in fact, he says, Paul, in a sense, if this is the route that, that you go, trying to kind of keep one foot in Christianity and, and one foot in, in keeping the law, you are actually severed from Christ. You have fallen from grace. Now, that doesn't mean saving grace, friends. Just simply God's grace that is a part of Christ's church to which these folks had been, again, participating in to some degree. And we know this because Paul goes on to address the true believers down in verse 10, in verse 10 there, where he says, I have cut, excuse me, <coughs> uh, I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. Meaning, you who are the true believers will adopt no other view. You will not fall away from grace, but will indeed persevere in the Christian faith. Again, there's others, but that's, that's just kind of key ones. And, and, and with the others, it's, it's much of the same. We need to move on and ask our next question. Secondly, is your salvation secure? Is your salvation secure? Turn to Jeremiah 32. Go back here a little bit. <clears throat> Gosh, excuse me, I hate this. Snuffing and snarfing and coughing and hacking. Ay, ay, ay. Jeremiah 32. <clears throat> the context here is the new covenant. The new covenant. God, through the prophet Jeremiah, just laid out in the new covenant just laid out the new covenant in chapter 31. He continues here in chapter 32 and verse 40. The new covenant, of course, would replace the old covenant, the old law covenant, the Mosaic covenant. And then later on in Scripture, we come to learn that this new covenant would, would be instituted through the blood of Jesus. And it would completely forgive sins once and for all for those who are the elect, those who would place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 32, beginning in verse 40, says this, I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. Now, remember, friends, that eternal security is all about God being sovereign, and in this instance, we could ask, well, who is the one who makes this everlasting covenant with the people? God, right? Who is, who is the one putting the fear of God in their hearts? God. What is the consequence of this? God will not turn away from them, and they will not turn away from God. God will not even allow it. Turn to John 6. John 6. Try to move a little bit quicker here. John 6, beginning in verse 38. 
John 6, 38, Jesus is speaking to a crowd of people. They're in Capernaum. And he says this in John 6, beginning in verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me. That of all that he has given me, parentheses we could say elect, right? I lose nothing. But raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him, I like to underline this word, will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. You say, but what if someone stops believing? They, they, they stop exhibiting faith. It sounds like, like their salvation and eternal life is only secure as far as they continue to believe. Well, that's not exactly the case because of what Jesus said in verse 39 when he says that of all that he has given me, I lose how many? Nothing, but raise it up on the last day. So again, let me ask you, who is it that God gives to Jesus? He gives the elect. Who have we learned are the ones who will repent and believe and receive? The elect. Jesus has just stated unequivocally that whoever the Father has given him, the elect, none, none, none will be lost. None will be lost. No one will lose their salvation. No one can forfeit it. Nobody can hand it back. In other words, if they stopped believing, it means that that they were professing believers again, not true believers with saving faith. Turn over to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 27. Now a familiar passage to us where Jesus is speaking to some Jews who had gathered in the temple. We looked at this, I don't know if it was last week or the week before. But Jesus says this in John 10, beginning in verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand did you get that pretty cut and dried crystal clear so the one who follows christ is given eternal life they will never perish no one can take them away from christ or the father You might be sitting there thinking, well, okay, yeah, yeah, Pastor Jay, uh, maybe, maybe somebody else can't take a believer from Christ's hand, but what about me? I mean, if I have free will, I should be able to remove myself from his hand. Well, my objecting friend, don't the words no one include even you, even the believer? And also, even even if the person could remove themselves, well, that hardly plays into Jesus' intention for this passage. If that was an exception, Jesus, you think, certainly would have mentioned that. And furthermore, the believer in Christ is told that they will never perish. This is emphatic. Literally, they shall certainly not perish forever is the meaning there. Nothing can separate you, friends, from the love of Christ. Regarding your your free will and God's choice and of keeping you, as we've said many times now before, right? We have to just remember there is a tension that gets held amongst these truths. Might also be good to remind ourselves of Romans 8, 29 to 30, which says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. These whom he called, he also justified. These whom he justified, he also glorified. Notice, friends, it doesn't say those that he may call. It doesn't say those that he might justify. It doesn't say, you know, those that he will hopefully glorify. But rather, Paul writes in the past tense, it is a done deal. Signed, sealed, delivered before the foundation of the world. 
Turn to 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1 in verse 7. This is the intro to the letter. 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 7. Paul is uh, <clears throat> saying some nice comfy things here. We love this passage. In the beginning, and he brings up Jesus at the end of verse 7, at the end of verse 7, where he says, Our Lord Jesus Christ, beginning in verse 8, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Who will confirm you to the end and make you blameless? The Lord Jesus Christ, who called you into fellowship with his son and who is faithful to make sure all of these things are accomplished of course god can either of these two lie or say that they're going to do something and then not do it of course not they would cease to be god in fact titus 1 and verse 2 tells us that god cannot lie i love what paul tells timothy in second timothy 2 and verse 13 even when we are faithless god remains faithful for he cannot deny himself God and his son, friends, are faithful. They bring you your salvation and eternal life to pass. Not you. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14 is that classic passage where we read about the fact that we are actually sealed in Christ, in him, with the Holy Spirit of promise who has given us a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession of the praise of his glory. And then in Ephesians 4 and verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. A seal back then, it was a sign of ownership. It was a sign of possession. You, you think of the king's signet ring too and sealing something, you know, in, in the wax. Because it's his and in this case, it's Christ who owns you. It's his Holy Spirit who seals you. He has made you his possession until the day of redemption. And fortunately, you can't unseal yourself or disown yourself from him. In Philippians 1 and verse 6, we're told that he will perfect our salvation until the day of Christ Jesus. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 to 24, right? A passage that we uh, had, had a while back. He will bring your salvation to pass. In 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5, it is Christ who has caused us to be born again to a living hope, or God that has caused us to be born again through the res resurrection of his son Jesus. And in that sense, too, we see that our inheritance, it's imperishable, it's undefiled, it will not fade away, it's reserved in heaven. You who are protected by the power of God for a salvation ready to be revealed, made fully manifest in the last time. If you're still not convinced, we have this last point. I'm going to try to just skate through some of the highlights that I know we're, we're running out of time here. If you're still not convinced, though, I hope you are. You still have this lingering doubt in your mind. You think, oh, I just think you've interpreted everything wrong. Okay, well, here's the thing. It still wouldn't work to say that you could lose your salvation, and here's why, based on our previous studies. Again, you remember that illustration in the beginning, the tapestry, all the things tied together in the back. What happens if you start clipping and cutting and ch -ch 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 -ch, and it starts falling apart? The same happens if you cut out eternal security. Just think back before the foundation of the world, or we'll go back to before the foundation of the world. None of us can think back that far yeah, we, we were in God's mind, but we weren't actually there yet. When God chose you, when you were foreknown, when you were elected and predestined for salvation, because here's the thing, if you could lose your salvation, here's what would have to happen. You would have to then be unpredestined. You would have to be unforeknown, unelected, and unchosen. You go, well, that doesn't make any sense, right? Because the whole point of these is that God and God alone accomplished our salvation back in eternity past. He's done so apart from, apart from any of us or any other external force so that he alone would get the glory, right? And for argument's sake, what if you could lose it? What if you could lose it due to your sin? Where would that leave God? He'd basically have to apologize to you. Gosh, I, I am so sorry. I, I, I was really hoping that you wouldn't go that route and do those things. And 
because, see, my power only goes so far. Friends, the last time I looked, John 3, 16 doesn't say that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life unless he sins so bad he loses his salvation. It's just not there. I mean, what kind of power does God, you know, really have if you can lose your salvation, if you can have it taken away, if you can hand it back? Because we're looking at a powerless God then. I mean, can you imagine God saying, well, yeah, you know, I had the power to do those things back in eternity past, but I used it all up. (laughs) Sorry, you're on your own now. Hope you make it. I don't know. I don't have enough to keep you saved. It took a lot to save you before the foundation of the world. It's ludicrous. I mean, just to continue in this vein of losing your salvation, because losing it also implies the ability that you could get it back. By whose means? Yours? Mine? Right? I mean, God's? You know, so you you lose your salvation, uh, God gives it back. You lose your salvation, the next day, God gives it back. Oh, same day, you lose your salvation, God gives it back. It's like a ping, bum, 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 right? Yeah, schizophrenic again, right? You would never really know if you're saved from one day to the next. Okay, okay, argument's sake. What if you could earn it back? Well, if you could earn it back, then it would have been pointless of God to elect and predestine you in the first place because he could have just waited until you chose him and got yourself saved, right? Oh, yeah, there's that, that pesky Bible, though, telling us that it doesn't work that way. And along with going back and undoing what was done in eternity past, God would also have to remove his saving grace. Think about that. What's the point of saving grace? <laughs> that, that it's given to us be, in receiving salvation that we wouldn't deserve. In addition, he would have to undraw you from himself. He would have to unilluminate you, your mind. He'd have to close your heart. He'd have to ungrant you belief, faith, and repentance. He would then need to unforgive you, unjustify, unpropitiate, unredeem, unreconcile, unregenerate, and unatone for your sins. Oh, that's a problem, huh? I mean, what, what, what is it that allows us to stand before God blameless, justified, forgiven, completely atoned for the blood of his son? Jesus' death on the cross and his blood made perfect atonement for your sin. If you could lose your salvation in any way, shape, or form, or what, what would that say about Jesus' sacrifice for you, that it wasn't enough? That it wasn't sufficient? It could forgive some sins but not all? What if everyone, what if everyone who was saved decided to hand back their salvation? Jesus died in vain. He died in vain then. His blood was shed for absolutely nothing, if that were the case. Obviously, this utterly tears at the core of what saves us, friends, and the audacity that it would take to say to Christ, I reject your sacrifice. I hand it back. Your blood is worthless to me. That is why these people cannot be renewed again to repentance. This would then have to be followed by the removal of his Holy Spirit from from you, which we already said the scripture doesn't allow for in the New Testament saint, uh, he would have to undo his union with you. He would have to unadopt you. Imagine what that would be like. We have three adopted children. The idea of unadopting them? Ugh. It's horrible. Horrible. Oh, and then guess what? If you get unadopted, guess who you get readopted by? Satan. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have, uh, like I said, yeah. He would have to unsanctify you, finally take back his promise of eternal life, which would then make him a liar and deceiver because it wasn't really a promise. (laughs) Folks, here's the thing. God would never scratch that. He could never allow you to become unsanctified saved because if you could lose your salvation hand it back or forfeit it this would show god to be powerless it would make him a liar and if that were the case he would cease to be god the truth is if god had the power to elect predestine you in eternity past guess what he has the same power in the present to save you to keep you saved on into eternity. He is your omnipotent 
all-powerful, sovereign God. Friends, your salvation is secure, and that should bring such joy, and it should bring such peace to your life. It should give you a confidence that, friends, the worst that you and I as believers will ever experience will be in this life. The best is still yet to come. Still yet to come. You know, there's not a lot in this life that doesn't have the potential for change. Ugh. And I know a lot of us don't like change, and we fear change. But that is one thing that will never, ever change. Your salvation being secure. And just lastly, appreciate the few extra minutes. Just, just remember what this doctrine is not. This doctrine is not a license to sin because your salvation is secure. Well, great. I just go out there and do whatever I want, right? No, it's just the opposite. For the one who realizes that their salvation is secure, that should just cause gratefulness to well up inside of us and that we would have a, a deeper desire to live all the more righteously for the Lord. Th this doctrine of eternal security should cause us to praise him. It should cause us to, to thank him and, and, and have a, a, a desire to tell others of these tremendous truths. Go ahead and please stand as we close out our, our time here and, and we'll be ready for a uh, the band here to come on back up and just close us out. <clears throat> Romans 8. <clears throat> you can't go wrong with this. You're probably wondering, is he going to say that Romans 8 passage? 35. Here's your benediction. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. Father God, we thank you for these tremendous truths, this great, great and glorious doctrine of eternal security. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that needs to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your son, may they do so right now as we're praying. May they just confess their sin before you and their, their recognition that they need a Savior and that Jesus is the one who died in their place, that he went into the grave, but three days later rose from the dead, conquering death, Lord, that they too might have will have resurrection, Lord, when, when, uh, when Christ returns and, and he glorifies his saints. We pray all of this in your son Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.